Hello, my friends. How are you? I was trying to keep the phone sideways uh, so that you could have a broader view, but apparently uh, it doesn't work uh, these days. I was immediately informed to rotate my phone. So here we are, trying to steady the phone so I can speak to you. Oh boy, the phone keeps slipping. So I'm setting the phone so I can speak to you. Uh, I think we're all set. I think we're all set. And I see Abhishek Sharma, I see uh, Demetrius and Gabriella Amelian and Ramanan Dixit and Karen Pretty and uh, Sonia and Amy Lewis and it's amazing to see all of you from all over the world. Melissa from Arizona, joyful morning. Asmor from Norway, Ola from Norway. Uh, Rhoda Arbach uh, from the Bronx. Marie, David, Adrian. My friends from all over the world. Shraddha is also online. Okay, we're about 500 and I'm going to discuss today the nature and origin of thought and uh, the role it may have, if any, in self-realization. Self-realization means realizing who you really are. That's it. So self-realization is also called um, freedom. It's also called moksha. It's also called... Uh, infinite possibilities it's also called uh, uh, enlightenment <clears throat> being in the light of the source of all experience self-realization knowing yourself realizing who you really are the ticket to freedom the ticket to everything that you could possibly want <clears throat> the ticket to everything that you could possibly want um, in your life. So what is the role of thought? Ramanand Dikshit says, uh, great topic. And um, if you think it's a good topic, please tell me that uh, you like it. And you can inform me right here. You can press the like button if you want. And Maria... Matt says, Jai Gurudev, Jai Gurudev. Glory to the Guru. Aurora Carlson says, the goal of all goals, <clears throat> self-realization. By the way, I'm clearing my throat, not because of any issues, just, <laughs> just uh, needed to drink some water before I started, but I forgot and I'm not going to leave and get some more water. I'll do it at the end. So what is the role of thought, if any, in self-realization? Okay, so first we must understand what thought is. Where does thought come from? So where is a thought uh, before you have it? And where is a thought after it goes away? Okay, so shall we try some experiments to examine this? Shall we try some experiments to examine this? And my, my computer, my phone is still slipping off the computer. So hopefully we're all set. Where is thought before you have it? What is thought? And where does thought disappear after you've experienced it? So in order to do this, let's... Uh, let's um, actually do some thought experiments since we are talking about thought okay so let's play with a few thoughts uh, let me say a few words and let's see what happens okay strawberry now keep your eyes closed or keep your eyes open it doesn't matter but when i say the word strawberry strawberry mentally think it and see what happens do you experience an image or a taste or some sensation strawberry 
Empire State Building, India, Gravity, Atoms, Particles, Mother, Butterfly, Bird, Reptile, Dolphin, Tree. Okay, I think enough for a moment. As soon as I say the word, then, and you think it, you have an experience, okay? Well, in, of course, um, uh, the experience mostly is a mental experience. You see an image, I say apple, you see an image. If you want, you can also, f in your mind's eye, um, experience the taste, the smell, the texture, and all the sensations that um, we can think of associated with the word apple. Okay, so the word apple is a thought expressed right now in speech, as were the other words I just expressed, were thoughts expressed in speech that uh, contained the entanglement of experience. Entanglement means as soon as I said the word apple or rainbow or Empire State Building or any gravity, there was some mental activity in the form of an image or maybe a feeling if it was emotional, say if I said love or memory of love, etc. Then uh, you would experience something, a sensation, <clears throat> a subtle perception, an image, a feeling, just because I used the word. Okay, and actually that would also influence your perceptual activity. <clears throat> if you are thinking a certain thought, you're likely to actually encounter perceptual experiences associated with that thought. So think of uh, today, maybe uh, something like anything, Mercedes Benz, and you'll see that when you drive on the road, you'll see a lot of Mercedes Benzes. So uh, thought is uh, the embodiment of experiences and the recollection of experiences. And all I had to do just now is mention a particular thought and you had the experience. How did you have the experience? Because uh, um, you had the thought that I exchanged with you, okay? You had the thought. So what is thought? Thought is actually the recollection of experience. It also leads to other thoughts by association. And it is also the basis of all imagination and also all memory, okay? So a thought not only embodies an, uh, the entanglement of experiences um, and memories and desires and um, and uh, and feelings and emotions and perceptions it is also a means for us to communicate with each other so right now uh, we are exchanging thoughts you are actually giving me your thoughts right now in the form of squiggles that are coming through um, the, the networks and coming through electromagnetic fields and coming through cyberspace right here on my iPhone and my handheld device. We are exchanging thoughts. <clears throat> this is what we call the mind. Dan Siegel says, the mind is embodied and relational. It's a process that regulates the flow of energy and information. And to that I add, in the ecosystem of relationships. That's what the mind is. And uh, it has no location uh, because right now we're exchanging our thoughts. Uh, we're exchanging our mind right here. As a result, our brain activity is being modulated by each other. As a result, neural networks are firing, neurochemistry is being released, there is epigenetic modulation, and uh, depending on you know, um, how coherent and, 
and how much we agree on these thoughts, they're changing a total, totally they're changing our neurochemistry. Right now we are changing collectively our neurochemistry through epigenetic modulation and the modulation of neural networks and all of that. Okay, we're doing that. And so our thoughts are, uh, our thoughts uh, and our exchange of mind right now is um, modulating our biology together, collectively. And because we're having a very interesting, uh, hopefully, or we think we are having an interesting com uh, conversation and we're enjoying it, hopefully we're making lots of neuropeptides, oxytocin, dopamine, and uh, serotonin, and opiates. And if you're experien experien experiencing extreme joy, then anandamide, the peptide of bliss. And all these are neuromodulators, um, basically modulating the activity of uh, our immune system, hopefully in the direction of self-regulation, homeostasis, or healing. So thought is powerful, right? Very powerful. <clears throat> but now we have to go a little deeper, and we are communicating thought right now through sounds, and through squiggles, <clears throat> I'm communicating with you through noise, and you're communicating um, with me through squiggles. Except that the noise and the squiggles have been imbued as meaning. So, noise and squiggles, and any sensory experience, perceptual activity, imbued with meaning, is what thought is, meaning, meaning. And how does the meaning come about? How does the meaning of anything come about? How is the meaning of this experience come about? Okay, this experience is, um, and this experience, and this experience, which is going to be my breakfast after I finished, that experience is given a name, okay? It's given a name, watermelon. But before I call it watermelon, it is a taste and a smell and a texture and a sensation and all of that. But as soon as I say watermelon, then the collection of those perceptual activities and those interpretations becomes the experience that we call watermelon. Squiggles and noises imbued with meaning is thought. And before it is a squiggle or, as a, or a noise, okay? Before it is a squiggle or a noise. It's a thought. So thought is a means of communicating our experiences back and forth, back and forth. And right now we're using this process to communicate through a global network called the internet and it is our evolving global brain. What is the source of thought? Well, you are the source of thought. As soon as I think uh, watermelon or actually here's a piece of mozzarella cheese, then you think of that experience. That's all you think of. Okay, so um, thought is therefore a modified form of awareness. You have to be aware of this experience before you can call it something. Okay, before you can call it something, you have to be aware of this experience, any experience. So what is a thought? It's a modified form of awareness. You as awareness modified yourself as the experience that we call thought. It was very easy. How did you do it? Just through attention and intention. And because the thought is entangled with other experiences, that's the mechanics of actually um, giving meaning to any experience, because raw experiences, as I've said, just perceptual and mental activity. So when we imbue it with meaning, then 
we reify that experience, we call it an object, and as Ramanan Dikshit is saying something that we've discussed before, consciousness conceives, constructs, governs, and becomes the experience. Consciousness is modifying itself, awareness is modifying itself as thought. So what is the source of thought? Consciousness, awareness. And so what is the role of thought for knowing ourself as awareness? Okay, does it have any role? A lot of people say it has no role. The only way to know yourself is to shut up. <laughs> the only way to know yourself is to shut up and be aware of being aware. This is, you know, the latest movement right now uh, in uh, contemplative self-inquiry. Rupert Spira, Greg Good, uh, many, Lucille Francis, uh, the tradition, of course, comes from Atman and Krishna Menon and many other luminaries in the field of Vedanta, including, uh, uh, including Ramana Maharishi. And they say, yeah, you know, you can directly experience um, the awareness of awareness, but also you can directly examine your experience um, of reality <clears throat> and when you do through inquiry you will find that what you call the external world uh, doesn't exist what you call the internal world also doesn't exist they're all fluctuations of consciousness and we can have direct experience of that through inquiry so this kind of experience through inquiry of course requires thought you need thought to do inquiry so uh, this then is a means to self-realization through what is called Gyan Yoga. Gyan Yoga. Um, the Yoga of the Intellect. The Yoga of the Intellect is not uh, dogmatic thinking. It is self-inquiry. If you deeply inquire into who am I, and then you deeply inquire into what is it that wants to know who am I, then you deeply inquire, um, am I my changing body or am I the awareness in which I am having the experience of the changing body? Then you deeply inquire, am I the changing mind or am I the awareness in which the changing mind is the experience? Am I the changing intellect? Am I the changing uh, uh, emotions? Am I the changing personality? Deeply inquire and then what happens is consciousness or awareness reveals itself to you very spontaneously. It's called spontaneous awareness. And also this leads to spontaneous right action, spontaneous right thinking for the future, which means evolutionary because you are bent upon knowing yourself. You're bent upon what is called knowing the experience that we call Atma Darshan through deep inquiry. And this is Jnana Yoga. It's not dogmatic thinking. It's reflective self-inquiry followed by stillness. And then thought can actually help you get to self-awareness. The other way, of course, is uh, to just shut up, ask yourself, who am I? And allow any sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, and synchronicities, and epiphanies, and relationships, and encounters to reveal the truth to you, because you have um, uh, asked the questions, the right questions. It's not a it's important not know the <clears throat> it's important not to know the answers before you start because if you know the answers then there's nothing to learn the highest intelligence is not knowing because what we know is a very small sliver as i said of perceptual activity so deep self inquiry and then transcendence transcendence means going beyond thought one of the ways we go beyond thought that is actually through 
the repetition of seed uh, or bij mantras when we practice mantras bij mantras and mentally recite them then they interfere with the usual thinking process and once in a while they cancel each other out and then we are back in the source of thought which is the source of all experience and therefore the source of what we call everyday reality okay so thought has a role thought has a role uh, we can use thought to understand thought and we can also use the dynamics of consciousness through mantra practice and self awareness and actually awareness of modified aspects of the self which are mind body and perceptual activity uh, and then we can uh, actually transcend the whole experience because we know that everything that we call experience the physical world the body and the mind is consciousness fluctuating as thought which embodies in human beings every experience because humans don't leave thought alone when you know when you have a thought whatever the thought is preceded by an awareness of a perceptual activity then when you have that uh, experience um, you create a narrative you create a story oh this is a delicious breakfast that i'm going to enjoy as soon as i finish uh, speaking with you and then there's a story after that i have to go and give the lecture etc etc i don't want to be hungry see we start um, telling stories we are storytellers and then we believe our stories and uh, uh, we create uh, an experience of what we call outer world inner world there's no such thing <laughs> we create the experience of body mind universe no such thing just you fluctuating fluctuating eternally and now as the human story of uh, mind body universe ramanand dikshit says deep listening is shravana shakti shravana shakti deep listening in stillness okay so is thought useful most of the time not because it's recycling the conditioned mind but if we examine the nature of thought contemplate the nature of thought inquire deeply into the nature of thought and who or what is having the thought then thought can be both tran thought can be both a tool and also a means to transcend itself and when we transcend all stories we have self realization and then we have also um have the choice in that self awareness to weave the stories that we want to produce to script our life script and uh, become the protagonists the heroes the villains the producers the directors the choreographers of our stories this is actually what karma is it's just the recycling of stories and then if we transcend the stories and know ourselves beyond all stories then we have the freedom to create any stories and also the freedom to go beyond all stories ultimate self realization when we know that the self of the individual is the self of the universe joan asks is inspiration a thought no it is not inspiration leads to creative thoughts but inspiration as the word implies is to be in spirit okay my friends speak to you tomorrow <laughs>